everyone, welcome to this NDTV special. Is India's economy finally turning around? That was the focus of a discussion that followed the launch of a book here at Delhi's India International Centre by T. N. Nainan, Chairman of the Business Standard. But instead, Arun Shori, who was one of the participants of the book launch, used the occasion to launch a blistering attack on the Narendra Modi government. All the more surprising since he was seen, at least until recently, as a very strong advocate of Mr. Modi and his policies. But Mr. Shori instead used the occasion to claim that there has been no improvement since the NDA came to power. In fact, he said things have gotten worse, even making what has now become a headline statement that the NDA is simply the UPA plus a cow. The evening began on a sedate note with Arvind Subramanian, Chief Economic Advisor and former Foreign Secretary Sham Saran making opening remarks on Nainan's book, using their own experience to describe how the book tackled the challenges posed to the Indian economy. I'm in an awkward position because I have to pretend I have no opinions about this government, the last government, you know, <laughs> and yet have to say something, uh, something uh, serious and, and, and meaningful. So, I think when we think about India, and again, this is something that comes out in the book again, you know, uh, uh, reading through the pages, I think what is, I mean, I will absolutely insist that India is one of the unique development models, absolutely unique uh, development model, which is why I think it makes it so interesting and what makes the book so rich. You know, the, the old joke about, you know, everything and its opposite is true, uh, is actually true. But it's actually true for two, a combination of two reasons which I think are really compelling about India. One is, I call this the precocious development model. It's precocious development in both an economic sense and a political sense. It's precocious in an economic sense in the following things. India is a country that is not following the normal pattern of development, economic development, in the sense of using its comparative advantage and growing. The East Asian economies all grew using the cheap, unskilled labor, did manufacturing, and that was the way out of underdevelopment. India, as I like to put it, is growing not by defying its comparative advantage, but by defying its comparative advantage. Why? Because it's much more skill intensive, it's much more services based, and you know, we, yes, we have make in India and so on, but the future is uncertain I mean, in terms of going forward, whether we will escape out of underdevelopment, following the more normal path of these stations, which will require, mind you, a massive correction from the current strategy. On the other hand, if India makes it on the basis of the current model, it will have been very, very unusual. Almost the first country in history to grow based not on using, but on underusing its comparative advantage. So that's the, uh, the Indian precocious development model from an economic sense. The second political sense is that if all political scientists have noticed that you know, India maintains in a sustained democracy at very low levels of income, very low levels of uh, literacy, high levels of social cleavage and being a very agrarian economy. So now it's something that we celebrate and rightly so that you know this is an amazing achievement. Again, very few countries have done that. But I think what we don't step back and ask is whether in terms of our economic development, whether this this precociousness politically may have had some you know consequences for us in terms of our economic development. Uh, in a column I wrote a few years ago in the Business Standard, in fact, I was more modest in referring to India as a, quote, premature power. Uh, the point is that India has a macro impact much larger than warranted by its modest indices of economic and social welfare. In terms of uh, GDP, in perhaps purchasing power parity terms, India may already be the world's third largest economy, but in per capita terms, it remains far, far behind. Uh, it may be the third largest emitter of carbon emissions globally, and yet in per capita terms, it will rank with some of the most energy poor countries in the world. Uh, India will therefore matter hugely to the rest of the world, even if it does not attain first world or even second world standards of personal well-being and affluence. This makes India both a demander in terms of global public goods, but its choices can also affect how the world will deal with serious issues such as global climate change, global public health issues, 
and in the political and security side, issues of uh, weapons of mass destruction, proliferation, international terrorism, human trafficking. This makes foreign policy making and action a most complex exercise and sometimes even schizophrenic. The good economist in Dynam shines through the book. He points to the perverse incentives that may knock the bottom out of the Make in India initiative. If you can make more money through the rich profits offered by the plethora of arbitrage opportunities the economy offers, thanks to somewhat incoherent and often contradictory policies, then why invest in risky ventures? And when politicians become businessmen in order to derive arbitrage profits, why would they be a party to, their, to uh, the dismantling of, of these perverse incentives? Uh, the only um, slight reservation that I had about uh, after reading uh, Nigel's book is that, um, you know, I hope it does not encourage people who believe that, uh, you know, India really doesn't have to do very much in order to uh, modestly succeed that uh, there is something, some inevitability about India's emergence as a global power, uh, which uh, you do not really need to work for. And I think uh, that's not true. Uh, in this country has an immense uh, you know, propensity for uh, shooting itself in the foot. And I do hope that uh, Daniel's book does not encourage that uh, tendency amongst, uh, amongst ourselves. But then Mr. Shori's turn came for opening remarks, where he set the tenor of what was to come when he systematically debunked many of the NDAs and Mr. Modi's pet schemes, claiming they were simply built on hype. We must examine every claim. Do not believe any figure that is put out by any government. I'd give you an example from taken from uh, from uh, business standard. We are told again and again FDI has increased by 40 percent in in one year. A.K. Bhattacharya showed the increase by 21 percent uh, in coal auctions. Again and again we were told two lakh crores. I gain two lakh crore I And Ishan Bakshi and his colleague showed that actually speaking, that is what would. But two lakh crores will come. That, of course, includes royalty which would have come whether you auctioned it or allocated it. But even more, that that would come if the mines were operated at full capacity by the winners for 30 years. In 30 years, coal will not be the preferred fuel. And in any case, this year, the amount is probably about 7,000 crores. Kaha 2 lakh crore, kaha 7,000 crore. Spectrum auction may be way away. Black money may be way August may be way 6,500 crores have been unearthed and brought. Abhi September, na, abhi uh, October may be a very good thing. Because the law is 6,500 crores. Now, it is 3,500 crores. Aaya tha. And that compares to the receipts under the earlier voluntary disclosure scheme of 7,800 crores. So we should examine every claim by any government. Disinvestment, I can never understand. Look at the success, oversubscribe, how much money is going to be given to LIC? 90%, 95% of the money is going to be given to the subscribe has come from LIC or from other state financial institutions. Disinvestment. So the first thing to learn from Nainan's book and from what he writes and from the culture which he has built up in business standard is examine every claim of every government. Second is keep track of every promise. Investor summits every state is doing investor summits. Nanan also mentions all these new announcements of projects. So I had for some other purpose to examine. So I started examining this RB to Tamil Nadu. Gujarat ki investment vibrant Gujarat summit. So what actually happened to the projects which were announced? 
you can't get it from the Gujarat government. So I contacted the Center for the Monitoring of the Indian Economy, Mahesh Vyas. It is the most opaque figure. And they have been trying to get this, they can't get it. He says, we have an entire um, f floor of people who monitor these projects, but we can't get this. But our best estimate, and he's given several reasons for it, is 20% of the announcements resulted in a project. Now, P. Sainath's article came. This time, in January, I summit in Gujarat. Can, can anybody, even these big people like Deepak Lal, Swaminath, can they guess how many MOUs were signed? There were two working days. How many MOUs were signed between the Gujarat government and industrialists? 21,000. <laughs> Sainath has calculated that meant one MOU per four seconds. <laughs> so, we should examine every claim, we should track every promise. A package announced hota hai. कभी ये नहीं बताया जाता कि साहब पहले भी नहीं बताते थे अब भी नहीं बतलाते कि साहब भाई पैकेज है ये आपने सिर्फ रिबन बांधा है इधर उधर से बटोर कर चीजें हाउ मेनी ऑफ देयर एग्जिस्टिंग स्कीम्स 1.25 लाख फॉर बिहार हाउ मेनी ऑफ द एग्जिस्टिंग स्कीम्स वी डोंट नो जया सुब्रमण्यम ही टेक इट इट विल रिक्वायर अ वीक अटेंडेंस फॉर हिम टू टेल अस एंड देन एज ही सेड ही कांट से बिकॉज़ नहीं दूसरा आप देखिए ओवर हाउ मेनी इयर्स दो साल में एक साल में पचास साल में 1.25 लाख करोड़ खर्चा जाएगा अभी इंडियन एक्सप्रेस ने बहुत अच्छा काम किया फ्लड्स आए इसमें श्रीनगर में इन टू विजिट्स द अनाउंसमेंट वाज 1745 करोड़ एज ए स्पेशल पैकेज बट हाउ मच इज गॉन एंड इट इज कश्मीर if you don't send the amount which you promised, they'll say, okay, no, no, they can't. India, I mean, discriminate rata hai. India jhoot bolta hai. Toh kitna gaya? Indian Express did an investigation. 1,745 crores precise figure, 300 crores have reached. Or wo government par pahunche hai. Niche tak ke pahunche. So, if unpackage every scheme, follow every promise, Examine every claim. In that way, we will really learn from Nainan and we will serve the country. We will even serve a government. Because they will know we are being watched. Because many people don't seem to realize that when I do this, like our Rangachari says, that the hyper bole so nihal. Realize that when they do, say such things, big things, they are destroying the bird of the government of India, not a government. So we should not. Uh, 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 we should try and deter that, and we can do that by learning from Nainan that not just opinions but facts. Thank you very very much. Nainan. This is what happens when you don't take Arun Shori in the cabinet. <laughs> Let's uh, 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 get a bit of a discussion going. Uh, you know, perhaps picking up uh, from Mr. Shori's uh, presentation, which, though perhaps he may not have intended it to be, but ties into what I was trying to do as any journalist would with a panel like this, which is to contextualize the entire question of whether the tortoise uh, is going to have its turn or not with the present scenario and with the promise, uh, as I said at the outset, that uh, this government had come with and whether indeed uh, we're anywhere closer to that. And, and, and can I set the ball rolling with you, Mr. Shori, that uh, you did a fairly effective job of, of debunking some of the 
the hyperbole or the hyperbole uh, <laughs> of, uh, of at least uh, this government's announcements. But in terms of uh, the actual movement on the economy, and, and that, as I said, was the narrative that this government came with, that finally now, uh, with all respect to Dr. Singh, that, uh, you know, uh, the UPA with all its infirmities had been cast out, and now we're actually going to see some movement. Now, you had said, I remember, I think closer to the time of uh, the first anniversary of, of this government, that patilon ki awaaz aa rahi hai, lekin khana nazar nahi aa Do you actually now see any sign ki khana parosa ja raha hai, or do you still feel that what we're seeing on the ground is not matching expectations? I don't know. One answer is that the doctor has been told 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 that Plus a cow. <laughs> so, there is Congress a, plus a cow. Uh, no, but scaled up. Scaled up. So, my policy is going here. Second difference really is that there is a much firmer, uh, clearer belief uh, that managing the economy means managing the headlines about the economy. And this is not really going to work. Um, I was just asking uh, Atwind about uh, how he is, uh, how he feels about his uh, tenure, and he was saying he's very satisfied because he has great freedom to work, and these are great issues um, uh, on which he is working. But uh, I think this is a sort of uh, a subjective satisfaction. Everybody is busy. Everybody is doing very hard work, but it is not resulting in the two, three big things that were. Uh, a problem at that time. For instance, yes. one of the, uh, I just give one example, yes. that private sector, you know, one of the, uh, the critical changes that happened in the last three years of the UPA government was mm. that private sector investment fell. Its share fell from, I think, what, um, 15, 16 percent to about 11 percent or so. That became the crucial thing. Now, if you see, the impediments that were there in uh, that that needed to be checked on taxation uh, tax administration virtually no change on banking reform it has been uh, delayed by a year and a half for no particular reason so therefore um, i mean this uh, dr is a, a very generous um, metaphor <laughs> <laughs> it's not just the hair who sleeps. And this, this should have happened at a time when everybody was saying, this is the, uh, this is disappointment. Before I move on to the others, I want to ask you very quickly, and you realize that you've already given us about two headlines uh, with just what you've said so far. But before I, I, I move on, I want to ask you very quickly, where do you think the problem lies? Because it's certainly not the mandate, you have the majority, you also have someone who's widely seen as a decisive leader. So where's the problem? I, I don't know, maybe it is in priorities, maybe it is because the whole truth is not told to our rulers, whoever the rulers are, maybe that's the problem. For instance, these okay. industrialists and all who meet prime ministers, they don't speak the whole truth. Oh, <laughs> nine out of ten. <laughs> so that is one of the big problems in India. And um, okay, I mean, and also yes. sorry. Yes, no, sorry. I didn't want to interrupt. But let's let's get uh, Arvind Subramanian. I don't want to put you in the awkward position of being a <laughs> spokesperson for the government, which you already said is not the hat that you've come wearing today. But let me at least ask you that in the broad brush characterization of this government as one that is not lived up to its expectation as uh, uh, one that would set the pace of the economy or of reforms uh, to the level that it was expected to. Would you, would you agree or would you disagree? You know, I, you know uh, 
uh, I was hoping this would be about the tortoise and not about the uh, <laughs> government performance because uh, you know it's it's a bit. Uh, I think we should focus on the book. Um, <laughs> but, but all I would say, all I would say in response to your yes. question is, you know, uh, Jagdish Bhagwati has a, a lovely book called Protectionism. It's a little small book. It's a great book, and you know, one of the footnotes uh, there's a there's a there's a, um, <clears throat> a little joke that he says that you know the the economist's wife turns to the economist and says, "Honey, do you love me?" And he says, "Relative to what?" Uh, <laughs> so, 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 in terms of you know, you know, uh, you know, relative. I mean, have we done relative to expectations, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? I mean, I, I think all of us will have a view on you know what was expected and how much was done and, and sure. how much was under and over. Well, let me not then phrase it in an overtly uh, a political or political economy way, vis a vis this government and, and previous ones. But just in terms of, uh, I, I think what Mr. Shori was referring to that you were saying about your own experience of having come from sort of outside the conventional political bureaucratic system and actually be part of the machine, as it were. Uh, did that, I mean, have, have you found that to be an environment and a, and a scenario where, with this particular government, with this, uh, and, and its vision, conducive to some of the ideas that you hoped you'd be able to, to implement and to the overall uh, thrust of the economy? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, uh, uh, as I was telling uh, Dr. Shuri that, you know, uh, I've been, you know, every day I've been surprised on the upside in terms of, you know, how much is possible, at least at, at my level, you know, whatever I have to do by way of analysis, I'm providing ideas, providing advice. And, you know, all, uh, and, you know, I, I'm honest in saying that, you know, I'm on a 24-7 high in this job. Every day I wake up, you know, absolutely super excited. Right. Um, uh, so, in, in that sense, I think that, uh, as I was also saying, at least in, in, in a job such as this, I think we have to do you know, the best that we can. Uh, that uh, why I was surprised, uh, pleasantly surprised was, you know, you hear all these stories about all the constraints that are imposed on outsiders. Yeah. But, I mean, I think that one of the dirty secrets of perhaps all bureaucracies is that you know, between the injunction that you must not do certain things and the stricture that you must do certain things, there's the whole gray area for, you know, really opportunistic, creative, uh, you know, uh, behavior analysis, whatever. And, and I think, uh, you know, so, so I've certainly had that space. You know, I've, I've never been uh, stopped in terms of generating and, and uh, you know, never been muzzled in any way. I've been encouraged to speak up. But yes. then, you know, then the question of, you know, but uh, what did it, what happened? What outcomes turned out? Yes. And you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, the people who make these decisions, you know, who are above my pay grade, obviously operate under some constraints. Which uh, I think that uh, it's not my job to second guess. It's my job, perhaps, to say some of these constraints should be relieved, some not. But uh, beyond the point, I think you know, uh, I can't second guess what these constraints are. Right. Then you. Actually, in a way, anticipate some of these arguments in your book, where uh, the point, the broad point from, from what Mr. Shori was saying is that uh, the idea that an, a change in government will not necessarily lead to a dramatic change in economic vision. And, and certainly the, the Modi government came with a catchphrase of minimum government, maximum governance, uh, which you point out in practice has not quite played out that way. So obviously there are challenges which transcend uh, uh, you know, changes in political regime or shifts in political ideology? Uh, I'm not sure if there's any uh, significant change in ideology and uh, maybe too early to see whether the change in performance. Um, the, the comment I think I, I would make is what I wrote in my uh, column last week, which is uh, the orientation of this government is towards projects rather than policy. Uh, you could argue the previous government focused more on policy um, and projects got stuck. And this government is trying to unstuck those projects mm. and focusing on them. The danger for them in doing that is that projects have targets and numbers. So it's very easy, the way Mr. Shorty is done, to actually show up the claims against what you've achieved. If you say 100,000 megawatts of solar energy, sure. 60,000 the wind, um, so many bank accounts, so much money is gone, uh, so much money from black money coming in. Uh, the minute you're doing a project focus, uh, 
you could argue that it's partly the mission focus that I think the model the mission focus works mm. by and large. Uh, but the risk is that uh, you then just at the end of five years, hello, you said these are the numbers and look what they are. You know, it's a tricky game to play. But you know, on the subject of projects, which certainly seems to be uh, a, a very key focus, as you said, of this government, and and placing it in the context of whether you you try to do too many things at the same time. And I think that's one of the things you bring out in your book, is that countries like India, because of size, unlike the, the East Asian Tigers, for instance, which had a more singular focus, are trying to achieve multiple objectives. Now, if you look at projects in isolation of, for example, looking at what's happening to the banking sector, and, and stress loans and so on, uh, you know, you, you find that you're not able to get them off the ground. Uh, and, and let me put that to you, Mr. Shori. I mean, when you talk to uh, actual changes on the ground in terms of reform. One big obvious aspect of, of the current economic impasse seems to be that banks are <coughs> heavily strained, uh, there's huge amount of bad debt, but is enough happening to address that? There are two points, first one, policy itself. There's a distinction that Nairon has made on between projects and policies. One of the problems which is uh, uh, unnerved uh, which has prevented investor confidence from coming back yes. has been self goals on policy, not just projects. Retrospective taxation, nothing clear was done. MAT, it's completely a self goal for no reason whatsoever. But it created a great flurry. Similarly, to bang your head against the wall with three ordinances on land acquisition, when you don't, you just leave it to the states. There was absolutely no reason for the central government to get into it at all. A general announcement would have done. Uh, uh, similarly, in this Judicial Appointments, com uh, com uh, Appointments Commission, a confrontation has been engineered. And especially by the kinds of arguments which were put forward on behalf of government in the court. It had never happened like this. That even very, uh, very uh, gentle judges I had to take the attorney general to task every day. So you have created a confrontation. Similarly, the second problem is that in India you can't do things unless you take everyone along. Chief ministers and so on. But if I get up every morning and start a boxing match, how can I take people along? <laughs> so these were self goals on policy and on execution. And uh, if I may say one point on which I am uh, <coughs> surprised. You see, there has never been, at least for us lay people who are outside and only go by newspapers or occasional uh, what we get from civil servants, there has never been as great a centralization of functions, not power, of functions in the BMO as now. But I feel that there has never been as weaker a BMO as now. Why would you say that? Well, by what is happening. So both things, you centralize the function, but you don't have the, you do not, those fellows don't have either the domain expertise or the authority that British Mishra had or LK Jha had or all these principal secretaries have had. Mr. Varma had at that time when these reforms were being done. Then things get stuck. And finally, even on banks, banks is a good example of timidity. Uh, the one thing that has surprised me about the government is its timidity. But slight opposition comes and the reform is dropped. Ye, aapne kya kya, uh, banks ka Indra Dhanush. <laughs> Seven strings. Achha, ek, ek string thi, ke bhi private sector wale ke jo private talent hai, that will be brought into the banks. Do announcement be taking of two persons slight flutter among of opposition and suddenly the, the banking secretary goes and says no 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 we are not going to induct anybody <coughs> it's a surprising thing <coughs> from people we regard I mean who were elected for the mandate was of because you are strong this will be a decisive government we will carry these things through and suddenly uh, you know Mr. Shori certainly be very critical of the government's track record so far, at least on the economy, but on, on foreign policy. And again, this is something to which I think Nainan devotes uh, a chapter or two uh, in his book. 
about having a more pragmatic approach, uh, both to our neighbors and the world at large, on issues like climate change, for example, and you being, in fact, involved in the past in those uh, negotiations. So do you see on that aspect, at least, that the court is, is turning, or if not, inching forward? What I uh, worry about is that, uh, uh, number one, I think uh, in terms of uh, uh, the, uh, the actual execution of foreign policy, uh, we seem to be again slipping into a uh, event mode rather than a process mode. That is, there is a sense that we are moving from one big event to another big event, uh, moving from one very successful visit to another successful visit, uh, and not paying enough attention on process. That is. Uh, visit leads to a number of decisions, number of initiatives, uh, but before actually the system is able to digest that and actually actually deliver on those, uh, you are already thinking about the next big visit and you are thinking about the next big uh, event. And uh, that has led to a slow erosion of credibility because I think we started off with, particularly with neighbors, I think uh, the fact that, uh, you know, Dr. Uh, that, uh, uh, Mr. Modi uh, took those very early initiatives with respect to the neighbors, I think was very welcome and, and really, uh, in fact, uh, long overdue. Yes. And a tremendous uh, uh, sentiment of positivity was generated uh, amongst uh, the neighbors. But uh, now, uh, more than a year later, uh, if you go to these countries, the grouse always is, uh, where's the beef? You know. Uh, <laughs> So there is, uh, there, is, uh, there is there is there is that uh, that that uh, issue that uh, needs to be uh, addressed. The second is I have a sense that uh, which is which is perhaps uh, uh, not entirely evident uh, on the foreign policy side, but uh, I think a more general comment I would like to make is that this mission approach or looking at projects, uh, you know. At the end of the day, at the national level, you need to fit that into a larger picture. That is, there must be some strategic picture. There must be some strategic sense of where you want to go. What kind of society you wish to create? What kind of economy wish, which you wish to create? To say the big picture, look, forget about that. Let's try and you know get these projects going, mm -hmm. or let, let, let's focus on specific uh, events. Um, at the end of the day, you need that big picture. And I have a sense that maybe that picture is somewhat blurred, somewhat not quite uh, there. And this, this is where what, you, what your right hand is doing is sometimes contradicting what your left hand is doing.